bring on my next guest, Casey Dowd, currently a face-off specialist for the Denver Outlaws, as well coaching at Colby College and coaching with the Face-Off Factory. How are you doing today? Not too bad, man. Just hanging out. It's a nice warm day up here in Maine, so it's uh, nice and enjoyable. Awesome. So you're not native to Maine originally. You're from Connecticut, and you went yep. to Daniel Hand High School. Did you start playing lacrosse in high school, or did you kind of start before that? So I started – my uh, background in lacrosse is pretty cool um, and pretty special to the MLL in the sense that um, my dad actually started the Professional Lacrosse League, um, and he was one of the original owners of the Bridgeport Barrage – um, so like guys like Roy Colsey and Doc and all these guys that started their careers playing in the MLL, um, you know, I grew up around those guys, which is pretty neat. Um, so I think my first stick, I got my stick when I was like in fifth or sixth grade. Um, I think I played defense for the longest time. Um, and then in eighth grade, I started facing off and kind of stuck with it and ran with it. Yeah, that's really cool. It seems to be um, when I talk to a lot of faceoff guys, no one is a faceoff guy from the start. Um, oh, no, no way turned and everything so when you're at uh, Daniel Hand um, you definitely showed out all state athlete um, in 2011 and you were all SCC team in 2010 and 2011 um, mm -hmm. that you took that career and uh, went to Siena um, mm -hmm. how'd that kind of happen can you talk a little bit about your recruiting process in Siena yeah so um, you know I played club ball I played for Yale's um, old club which was the you know Bulldog Lacrosse Club and um, it was a tournament you know I would, we'd go to all these tournaments wherever on the East coast and um, pretty normal coach saw me at a, one of the tournaments. We got to talking and kind of started the whole process just as it normally has and kind of how I go about the process now. So spoke with the coaches a ton, um, you know, spoke with them personally. They would write me letters, um, spoke to a couple schools and Siena kind of just stuck out as the place to be and took my official visit with a ton of guys. I think, 10 other guys that were going or interested in, in Siena and um, immediately fell in love. And I left school and I said I was going there regardless. So it was, it was pretty neat. It was strange. Coach Breck um, was recruiting me, recruited me all the way through the process. And by the time I was getting to Siena, um, he had actually just left for Rutgers. So I came in with Coach Speck just as Coach Breck was leaving as well. So it was, uh, it was definitely interesting um, changing coaches going into my first you know, day on campus. But, um, you know, I, I coach Beck's my, you know, one of the greatest guys ever. And it's awesome that I got to play with him for four years. Definitely. Definitely. Um, personally, my, the coach that recruited me also left after my freshman year. So I got three years with the new coach, um, two so far. Um, but yeah, definitely a, an interesting kind of, kind of process to do that. But while you were at Siena, you, again, just, you dominated. You were at, now you rank third all-time in Division I face-off attempts, fifth in ground balls, sixth in face-off wins. You're a two-time MAC champion and a 2014 MAC uh, face-off specialist of the year. Like, mm. that, how, is, how do you go from high school to just dominating your conference? So I'll say this, and, and it's not talked about in Siena enough, um, but my freshman year I came to Siena and we had this kid named Zach Trenner who is now actually a long snapper for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Um, and he came to Siena as a face-off guy, um, a transfer in. And I don't think I won a single face-off my first three months at college. Um, and he just taught me everything about, you know, he was way bigger than me. He was way stronger. But he, this dude took me underneath his wing and just, you know, completely changed how I saw the position and then also to change – you know, how I trained and how I saw things and how to play. Um, and he was like the best, like big brother going into a season ever. And then, you know, unfortunately he left to go follow football and at Assumption College, which it ended up being a great move because he's now playing in the NFL. Um, but, you know, it was one of those things is like, it was like really cool to work with this guy. I've never been so frustrated in my life going into a season, not winning a face off at all in practice or anything. Um, and then I kind of fell into place you know, of playing, right, of, you know, I didn't start the first game in my freshman year. Um, uh, another a senior, Chris Brancato, who was an attackman, switched to faceoff, and me and him were the, like, only real two faceoff guys going in my freshman year. Um, he started the season, and I'll never forget, he played, we played in the Dome against Hobart, and uh, we were going against Bobby Dottillo from Hobart, who was, I, I'm pretty sure he was number one and has been in the top 10 or so of faceoff percentage and wins and things like that for a long time. Um, and I didn't touch the field at all. 
um, and we didn't do great facing off. Uh, a couple games go by, and Chris, our starter, got hurt, uh, and we were going into go play uh, Virginia Military Institute, so VMI, who had Stephen Robarge, who was another 75% faceoff guy. Uh, Chris had rolled his ankle. He was out, and that was my first college start. Uh, was against this dude, Steven Robarge, and I finished 50% even. And, you know, you would have thought that, like, I had gone, like, 100%. The locker room was going nuts. The guys loved it. And uh, kind of from then on out, it was like, all right, like, I, I think I can hang with these guys and do, you know, play. And uh, that was kind of when I started going. So it, it was it was pretty cool. It was a really cool experience. I loved Siena. Super small school up by Albany. So, um, you know, really close with our friends and, you know, we had a really strong Long Island connection for a long time there. So a lot of my friends were super close and, you know, I'm still really, really close with those guys now. Absolutely. And then in 2014, your junior year, you were the face-off specialist of the year. That's, if anyone at any position to be called the best in their conference is amazing. Yeah. What was the differentiating from that, like from your sophomore year and then your senior year from that really, really special junior year? Yeah, I think it was just kind of a buildup, right, of, you know, right pieces falling in the right places. Um, and, you know, it was just kind of like an evolution of one, the face-off position specifically, right, is, you know, I'll be the first one to say ever, right, is the first time I saw someone carry the ball in the back of their stick and, like, play and, like, string their stick so it worked out was with Kenny Massa. And I had never, ever um, – or Kevin Massa, sorry, excuse me. But I had never seen that or done that before. And I think I just kind of started taking small pieces from different guys and adding it to my game. Um, and that was the year, ironically, that we ended up playing Kevin in, um, you know, in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And, um, you know, I think it was just kind of a culmination of, you know, really good guys on the wings. You know, I'll, I'll always give credit to those guys first because um, they bailed me out of a ton of situations that I knew I couldn't get myself out of. Um, and our coaches putting our guys in the right places. Um, like I, I talked about Coach Speck, um, Coach Cross, who was our offensive coordinator and just kind of, you know, always around the face-off position and really just helping me out personally um, has been awesome. And then the best face-off coach that I've ever had was actually a former player at Siena, um, Colin Parkhurst, who had never taken a face-off ever, I think, in college and maybe not even in high school. Um, but he was one of those coaches that just sat back and listened. And, you know, we filmed every single face-off and it was never, you need to do this right or different. It was, what'd you do wrong here? Or, or what could you do to fix this? And he let me be my own coach. Um, which I think has helped me one transition into being a face-off factory coach and, and a coach in general. But then two was that year was the year that I had my best season. And I really believe that it was because of him. That's awesome to hear. And then after your time at Siena, you transitioned to the next step, uh, which was the, the pro game. Mm -hmm. um, I know you got picked up by Rochester, I think on the waivers. Can you talk a little bit about kind of like really realizing like, yeah, this, this college lacrosse thing is pretty cool, but now I'm the next steps pro. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, we all joke around with our face off factory guys, right. Of being like the journeyman I've been like everywhere and anywhere, which has been, you know, some people would probably hate that. And I, I kind of love it. Um, but yeah, I finished at Siena and, um, didn't really know what the next step was, what I really wanted to do. Um, you know, right. You know, finish four years. And then the next step is usually go get a job and do something. And, you know, the, the top of the top are going to get, you know, a chance to play in the MLL or whatever. Um, and I just didn't know if that opportunity was going to come. Um, so, I, you know, I was sitting, at, I remember it, I was sitting at my grandparents' house and I got a call from the, uh, you know, the SID at Siena saying, hey, congratulations, you're super excited and all this stuff. And I had no idea that I got picked up. Um, but I got picked up off the wire and, you know, drove right up to Rochester. And uh, I'll remember my first practice with Rochester too is, um, you know, I did not win a single face off with them either. It was again, another culture shock of, you know, this is totally different new rules. Um, you know, everyone's bigger, faster, stronger, and everyone was the best there. So it was really a big transition year. And, you know, my first season that I got picked up, I didn't play a second. Um, and I was pretty fine with that because I knew I just wasn't up to par that way. Um, and then I think it kind of catapulted me into realizing, all right, like, you know, if I want to do this, I need to buy in pretty hard. And, uh, you know, I showed up the next year to training camp and, you know, Coach Sedan was the coach for the Rattlers at the time. And I remember him asking, he was like, what the hell happened to you? You know, it was like I came back like in much different shape and, you know, as a better player. And, you know, it was really a year where um, Drew Simino, too, was kind of transitioning from a guy that was 
more of, I don't even know if he had gotten a pro game yet, but he was becoming the guy for Rochester. Him ended up being two guys that used to work together and play together a lot, which was really, really cool. So that's kind of where it started. And then it kind of just started going from, you know, that to um, I was on the practice squad for, for a while and they would move me up to play a game and then I would move back down to practice squad. Um, but I fell in love with Rochester. Rochester was like really, really cool place. Um, the guys were awesome and they, they were really, really close with everyone. Um, but then it kind of started the whole journey all over the place. When you were at Rochester, did you overlap with uh, Matt Striebel at all? I did not, no. So I, I was with, honestly, if you look at the Chrome, is a majority of the guys that are in the PLL Chrome team were a majority of the guys that I, I matched up or, with. Um, and then, too, just kind of like, you know, the Connecticut Hammerheads when I was with Dallas, um, a lot of those guys as well. So um, that was more so the, the group that I was with. Cool. Um, and then after yeah. uh, Rochester, you made it to Boston. Was that a trade or just pick up off the waiver again? So it was, again, it's just off the waiver. Was, I, I don't think I, I haven't been traded ever yet. So I'm not that valuable yet. So, <laughs> um, but um, I got picked up off the waivers to Boston, played a couple games with them. And that's where I met Joe Nardella and, and started, you know, building a connection with him with Face Off Factory. Um, but played a season with them and finished, I think, four or five games in with them. Um, and then, you know, that following year, uh, I got drafted in the supplemental draft to the Ohio machine, went to training camp and, and did that whole thing with them. Um, Greg was cool. had hurt his hand uh, the first game of the season and played and he was just struggling. You could tell it was bothering him. So I got called up, played against the Chesapeake Bayhawks. Didn't do so hot. I think it was like 35%, um, you know, and you know, a couple weeks later they dropped me. Um, and in a week or so after that, I was picked up again by, um, who was it? Um, Boston. Boston again. Yeah. So I got picked up by Boston, played a game for them against um, the Lizards. Uh, and while Trevor was playing in Worlds, um, then got dropped again uh, and got picked up by Florida. Did the last game, or yeah, I think Florida, played a game with them. Um, which was awesome. Um, I played the last game of the season with them uh, in Dallas against all the guys that I had known forever in Rochester. And then the next season uh, got trade or, you know, picked up by Dallas and played with Dallas again. So that was a blast because it was back with all the Roch guys and the rats. Um, and it was really fun. Played a couple games with them, bounced back and forth, um, finished the season or two with them, played two years almost with them. And then uh, Denver came along for the uh, tournament and got to play with Denver, so which was awesome. And you know, I love the Roch guys and all the guys that we played with there. But um, you know, for knowing the Denver guys for ten days, it's been a pretty unbelievable um, you know friendship and kind of get to know those guys. And you know, even still, as you know, we finished you know a couple of weeks ago and we're still super close, talking to each other all the time, texting each other, and joking around. So it's been a really cool long travel and journey. But um, I've enjoyed every stop I've made so far. Well, in this kind of shortened Corona season in the in the bubble, you definitely did well. You finished, I believe, fifty four percent. Could be wrong on that one. Uh, with yeah. nineteen ground balls and one assist. Uh, yes. And I know we talked a little bit off air about this kind of like two headed monster that you guys really wanted to create. You and Max Adler, obviously, you guys both coach with Face Off Factory, and you kind of had a little bit more time maybe to game plan because some of the guys, some teams didn't take two people, some teams did take uh, one. Same as in the uh, PLL uh, with yeah. that kind of approach. How do you think that your system that you and Max kind of devised really led to success for you as well as Max? So I think going into it, we kind of recognized and you, we use the advantage two things. One is, you know, with the pandemic happening is my season coaching up in Maine at Colby uh, ended. So I didn't have to be up here. So I was down in Connecticut, my parents training my younger bro with my younger brother, who's going to be a, a fifth year at Stone or uh, Sacred Heart. And, you know, Max working at ESPN in Hartford, me and him were able to train every single day. So, you know, as soon as the pandemic hit, we were taking reps almost every single day, um, working out together, lifting together, running together. Um, so we just kind of started working together and, and tweaking each other uh, really well um, and, and for a long time. Um, and then so when they needed a backup, um, you know, uh, Zach Melillo got traded to Chesapeake. Um, they needed a backup and Max 
you know, reached out and said, would you like to do this? You know, and, and would you like to kind of be a two headed monster in this? And, and of course I said, yes. Um, one for the opportunity to play, but then two, because, you know, being selfish, right. Is instead of having to go against the best guy in the, in the league, now I get to work with him. Um, so, which was pretty cool. Um, you know, but I've known Max for a couple of years now and, and, you know, we're really good friends. We've got to work together a ton. Um, but going into the tournament, I think what we did was really recognize it as not a number one and a number two, but two guys going against one. Um, and, you know, whether it be, you know, me, I knew Max is going to take as many reps as he needed to or wanted to. And when he was gassed, um, he had no problem looking to the sideline and saying, hey, you got the next one, which was, you know, kind of, you know, being a faceoff guy, right? You know, having that big ego of, you know, I'm going to clamp and win every single one was – taking a step back and kind of swallowing my pride and being like, Hey, you know, it is, I'm fine with, you know, I'll, I'll wait until Max is ready. And then he's going to be tired. The other guy, you know, I can take advantage of that. And also to piggybacking off of that, um, you know, when he's tired, I can tire him out more. And now Max is going to win the next one because he's, he's fresh again. Mm -hmm. So we really approached it as, you know, a unit, but then also to me and him being a, a one rather than, you know, he'll take a ton until he can't breathe. And then I'll take a couple until he's good to go again. So I think you could see that it really worked out in our favor. Um, you know, I don't know the stats for all the teams, but, you know, both of us finished over 50, which, you know, right there is, you know, what you strive for. And then Max finished number one in the MLL, which was great. So um, I think, again, can't only talk about the face-off guys without talking about the wings. I think we had the best wing unit in – the, the tournament which was awesome and those guys helped us a ton win some face-offs that we probably shouldn't have won um but two is you know that two-headed monster really took into effect later in the, the tournament I think as well kind of pulling things up it really does seem like so Max was number one face-off percentage with just a hair under uh, 65 and then you you were there in five so there wasn't there's more than five teams in the league and you guys were two guys in the top five percentage um which really goes to show the other guys are people that have really done well previously in the pro rank. Uh, Kevin Reisman, who you both got a chance to go up against twice. Um, Alex yep. Woodall, No Rack, also face off factory guys. And just looking at it, the um, five top guys were all guys you know and have worked with coaching side and also on training side, which is a really kind of cool thing to see as a kind of a unit that you guys work outside of team uh, affiliations and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, every, as we always joke around, is all the guys that are local to New England. Um, before the PLL and MLL seasons, we all do, we, we do face-off factory training camp and, you know, Nards will come down and we have you four or five guys. We'll have like my brother, a couple college guys come with us and uh, just train and kick each other's butts. But I think it totally paid off. And I think too, going into the tournament is the fact that we took reps almost every single day was a huge advantage, right? Is, you know, if you're in lockdown and no one's local to you is you probably weren't taking as many reps as me and Max were taking almost every single day. Mm -hmm. So I think that definitely played a part in going into the tournament. Completely, completely agree. And I guess in that kind of going into nitty gritty of the face off stuff, you with that one, two punch of the really kind of established one and two kind of having that ego out of it for you mm -hmm. personally really seemed to work. And like you see other one, two systems, sometimes they don't work because one person, like you said, has the ego, like I'm going to clamp every time. Then you, like you said, like I'm going to go until I'm tired. Then I guess he can go in like as kind of like, yeah. I guess. Uh, and then in, in the PLL, you saw Drew Simino and Jake Withers kind of had a I, – I couldn't really see who's a 1-2, and you couldn't see a 1-2 in their percentage, but kind of a different style of that, that group mentality on just wearing down your, your face-off guy. Um, yeah. It's just really interesting to see how that kind of relates to then in college where it's really predominantly a one-man group. Then you have your wings, obviously, who, like you said, you never can say enough about them. Um, mm -hmm. But it's kind of interesting to see if – after a success like this maybe you've seen the NCAA tournament when there's kind of that a lot a lot of games that maybe you see more teams going with a kind of a two-headed monster yeah 100 percent. and I think you know especially at, at Colby but then it too and just our conference in the NESCAC is you know most schools I won't say all of them but most schools especially for us is you know both of our face-off guys took almost 200 draws each so you know having that different style and that's why it worked I think for me and Max too was you know Yes, we're knee down clamping guys, but if you ask anyone, as I think me and Max have very different styles in just clamping the ball. And it was something that, you know, it wasn't like Max was just going to dominate and I was going to come in and muck it up. 
but it also too was that you know you have to change what you were doing depending on who was going out there and me and max could change because we were the ones that were changing the matchup for the other guy so it was it was definitely really cool to be a part of but then too of kind of manipulate and kind of work with all right how can we set ourselves up for maybe you know not the second quarter but the fourth quarter and kind of at least maybe seeing this parallel because both the groups were on tv kind of seeing you and max i can kind of equate that to something similar of the PLL archers and they had that um the brendan fowler and then the the stephen kelly or bones kelly kind of matchup yep. like very similar like one guy had it one guy had it and you kind of let him run um but it was really kind of cool to see those two duos like in you yourself, including in one of them, do so yeah. well. Um, but, and then I guess kind of segueing off that, seeing you, I personally, get, I got to watch you on TV. And as mm-hmm. sure, uh, all lacrosse fans have been really kind of lucky to see lacrosse get on TV faster than other sports. Um, yeah. How was it to guess, I guess you didn't watch yourself play, obviously, but like for family and friends kind of reaching out to you saying like, oh my goodness, you're on ESPN. Like, was that yeah. a good feeling? Oh yeah. I mean, you know, it's, when you're playing, right, is like any time you're playing is you're pretty locked into that. So, you know, the the whole like playing without fans and stuff, yeah, it was weird that there was no one cheering. But um, at the same time, is like you're, you're just so locked into the game that you don't, don't really mind that much or care. Mm-hmm. Um, but what was cool, right, is like getting back to your phone and like, you know, your buddies are tagging you on stuff on like, they're like, oh, my God, you're on ESPN. And like, you know, you're on TV and like your last name's on the back of a jersey and they're talking about you going to like Madison Connecticut or being from Madison, Connecticut, and like Sienna. And that stuff was really cool. And then finally kind of taking a step back a couple of weeks out. And, you know, like I showed up to my parents' house in Connecticut and they were like, we watch you on like national TV. Like that, that, that part was really, really cool. Um, kind of like, you know, I mean, again, right, is, you know, realizing how small our sport is in the whole grand scheme of the world is, you know, the fact that you basically had either league, we basically had 30 days of great lacrosse on TV that had access to a ton of people was super cool. And the fact that I was able to be a part of that was, you know, pretty unbelievable. So I guess going into more specifics, you guys made it to the finals of the of the game. Mm-hmm. Um, you didn't have a semifinal based on some COVID outbreaks and kind of a burst of the bubble. Um, yep. I personally think you guys would have been in the finals anyway. So um Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, what was that? Obviously, didn't come out on top, unfortunately, um, but a very, very close game against, again, like an, a fellow face-off factory guy in Riesman. And just uh, what was that game like, kind of being in the finals um, of a serious MLL championship? Yeah, so, you know, it was – it's a weird feeling, right, is because, you know, not that it wasn't deserved at all, right? It's like, you know, we played great in, in pool play and everything like that, but, you know – we did miss a semifinal game, right? As everyone did, which is unfortunate, but, um, you know, stuff, you know, it happened. Um, but you know, it was, it was weird too, in the sense that we knew that they were missing some guys. Um, so going into a game, you know, not really with the, their full team. Um, and you know, of guys having to make the decision of whether they wanted to play or not. And, and we, we sat down before, um, the, the tournament and before they said that the other teams had backed out, um, and we said, right, is, you know, there's no judgment if you decide that you do not feel comfortable playing in this tournament for the rest of, you know, after the outbreak. So um, I think really, you know, it was kind of just go forward as a normal game after we kind of all made the decision and kind of, you know, said that we're going to do this. Um, and of course, right, it was, it was a tough game is, you know, it always sucks losing, but, you know, it was a, it was a great game by Boston. They did, you know, great things and, you know, it, was, it was fun to be a part of again. It was, it was a really cool experience. So I guess everyone's going to want to know, like, what, what is it like just being in the bubble? Like, I know you've said that, like, obviously, if you know lacrosse, Denver's always historically a super close team. Um, mm-hmm. What was that like, I guess, in a bubble where you're already forced to be in close quarters with your team? Yeah, so um, just kind of like the living accommodation part of it was pretty sweet is, you know, meals are catered. So you go downstairs and you have everything that you could ever imagine kind of set up for you. Um, but we stayed in a hotel about a half mile away from the stadium and everything you could possibly imagine was set up there. Um, you know, three meals a day, you can go get a snack if you really wanted to downstairs. Um, there was a rehab room set up downstairs, you know, Theraguns and trainers. Um, but it was a lot of just hanging out, right. A lot of these guys have normal nine to fives, you know, me being a coach, I was able to recruit and watch some um, tournaments uh, while I was in my hotel room. Um, 
but it was a lot of time on your own and you could kind of fill it with, with whatever you wanted. So, you know, specifically, I'll speak for the outlaws specifically was um, we had a blast together. Um, again, it's 25 guys that, you know, I had just met the day one of the, the camp or, or training camp and, and bubble. Um, but, you know, we played Wii golf for hours on end and, you know, um, I can't tell you how many times there was people getting in trouble for yelling during college, playing Warzone in their hotel rooms with each other. Um, so it was a really cool experience to be locked in with these guys, um, you know, just kind of doing everything, right? We ate all of our meals together to get, you know, you know, watch film together. We had team meetings all together. And we, as a team, stayed kind of um, segregated from the rest of the guys and the rest of the teams where – you know, I don't know if other teams ate all together all their meals or met up together as much as we did. But, you know, all of our doors were open to each other and we, you could find us hanging out with each other the entire time. Were you guys all in the same hotel? Yes. all of Everyone everyone was in the same hotel. And like that was right. No leaving. Everyone's locked in. Um, but again, there was really nothing that you needed away from that. If you needed something, you know, you could ask your equipment manager or, you know, like um, Bocklet, our team president, would go and make a run. They got us peanut butter and jelly for your rooms. They got you water bottle, whatever you needed. If you needed something from outside, you could have gotten it um, from from your president or equipment manager. But there was no reason to leave. It was pretty. It was pretty set up for us. What was the? I know that you've worked with True Lacrosse before. What was the setup going in? Were you were you rocking any of the in the True gear, or were you kind of going with what they gave you? So I was just kind of using what they gave me. Um, you know my like stick setup for it. I, was, I was using all string king um and i'm pretty sure almost all the guys almost all the face off guys are using all string king um or maverick stuff um you know shafts and stuff like that and i was fortunate enough that maverick maverick had given me a, a couple a pair of gloves to use as well which were awesome um so i you know i think they have the best product protective equipment so using their stuff was pretty sweet um but yeah just more so team issued stuff of the you know warrior elbows and and gloves and things like that as well. I had, you know, the burn cleats were awesome. I had gotten a pair of new cleats in forever. So it was great to get a new pair of those. Um, and honestly, the biggest, I don't want to say surprise, but I've never used any of the Powell stuff, but the Powell stuff was awesome. The apparel, the socks were unreal, um, but those were really nice. And then finally, right, is probably the most important part was the new New Balance jerseys. Um, it being so hot, I could not imagine being in one of our, you know, like a college, a thick jersey and things like that. Those things were unbelievable. They were super thin, um, really breathable, and were great. Cool. I know I would be remiss to kind of talk about, um, without talking about the uh, diversity in lacrosse and kind of the issue with the ent entire United States, um, yeah. the Black Lives Matter movement, and very powerful. The Black Lacrosse Alliance was kind of created with guys um, in all professions of lacrosse that are um, uh, identified as Black. Um, and there were four players in the MLL that really made a really good public stand. Um, Isaiah uh, uh, Davis Allen, Chris Aline, Chad Tolver, and um, Mark Ellis. They all kind of, anytime there was a national anthem, they'd stand with each other, kind of united in the middle of the field. Um, do, you, do you just want to talk about that at all? Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it was, you know, being in a predominantly white group of guys, um, pretty powerful that four guys were able to stand up and, and, did that representing themselves and, you know, the rest of the, the black lacrosse community, which is really cool um, and, and really powerful. And, you know, they were, had a chance to come speak with each team. Um, and I know, you know, we had two guys at a time come speak with the entire team and it was pretty powerful. And you know, I don't think there was enough done um, specifically just for, you know, for them or, you know, the black lacrosse players that are in our league or, or, or that are viewing and watching and supporting our, us. Um, but it was really great to kind of open the floor and have a conversation with those guys. And, and, you know, Chris Aline, for example, is a guy that I've played with and coached with and worked with forever. Um, and he's, you know, a really good friend of mine. I talked to him, you know, a, a good amount all the time. Um, and it was great to kind of let him just talk and have an open floor and, and see what he thinks needs to be done and what I can do and learn from him in what I can do to better myself and better the lacrosse community specifically. Um, but, you know, we went out and we supported those guys who stood behind them, which was really great. Um, anytime we played those guys or, or anyone that had a black lacrosse player on their, on their, you know, MLL roster, which was really cool. And then two is while we were there, right. The whole um, Iroquois national thing um, kind of came up where they weren't allowed to play in the upcoming world game. So, you know, Lyle taking a stand and, and, you know, supporting those guys as well was, 
pretty powerful. You know, we didn't get a chance to speak with him personally, but, um, you know, I think he made himself pretty vocal through Twitter and Instagram and things like that. Um, and so did other people as well. But, you know, specifically, I just knew Miles, or sorry, excuse me, Lyle um, did a ton with that. Um, but yeah, it was really powerful. It was great. Um, and hopefully people grasp onto that and do more with it. And it's not a conversation that ends right there, but continues into, you know, whatever your profession is outside of lacrosse and also to um, anyone that you're involved with, right? And it's great that, you know, there's a ton of platforms just like this where we can kind of start the conversation and lead people to, you know, those four individuals and, you know, the Iroquois um, people as well to, you know, if you have questions or you need to know more or want to know more about them, that you can totally go to them. Um, and I think that's really great about lacrosse is the fact that the community is so small um, and so close that, you know, people shouldn't feel weird to DM or just write an email or call, you know, any of those four guys, you know, the, the guys from the Black Lacrosse Association or people from the Iroquois people um, to ask them or find out how they can help. Yeah, and I know that just on the, the native side of things, there's a really big petition going along that I'll put the link below to sign. I think it's got almost 550,000 uh, um, signatures already that on that specific topic would be really great to see if you guys check it out. Um, but I know, I guess, kind of continuing on this thing of diversity in lacrosse, I know that you've worked with Harlem Lacrosse, which is a great organization that's trying to yep. really promote um, diversity in the sport, as well as the importance of academics. Yeah, so um, pretty cool opportunity. Um, coming out of Siena, um, you know, one of my, my housemates and roommates and one of my best friends, um, Richie Hurley, who was an attackman, he was an All-American at Siena, um, he became a program director. And it was honestly, it was not that Harlem Cross was starting up, but it was definitely much smaller than it is now and, and less prevalent. Um, and he, you know, went in right away and kind of started building a relationship with those guys and, and, and building this program up to what it's been. Um, and as I kind of started working through college coaching, um, I found it, I mean, I, I felt obligated to make it a, a duty to go and check these guys out and help out grow the game as much as possible. Um, especially in a place where, you know, I think if anyone has a chance to work with Harlem lacrosse in whatever city, whether it's, you know, Harlem or Boston or Baltimore, or, you know, out, out in LA is, um, you know, it really brings you back to being like a younger kid. Um, and like really just loving being out on a field with people and, you know, just really loving the game of lacrosse is those guys are super passionate about, you know, playing. Um, and they also too are just so thankful that they have something else to do other than the school or, you know, whatever it may be, or, or get them off of a, a path that might be leading them to somewhere negative. Um, and, you know, it really hits home for me, um, having Richie and, and working with some of these kids, but then also too now coaching at Colby College where, um, you know, Carlos Beeson, who is one of the first, he's, the, he's in the first graduating class of Harlem lacrosse students um, that graduated college. So, you know, being able to work with him for three years and see him grow from, you know, a freshman, a, you know, a kid coming out of Harlem to this guy graduating from Colby College with this unbelievable degree and kind of setting his, his self and his family's you know, future up for, you know, creating a different trajectory for what it was, which, you know, I think Harlem does an unbelievable job of that, um, of not only making it, you know, you're going to play lacrosse and go to college, but you're going to do really well in school, set yourself up for a really successful future. And then too, is give, give back to what those guys do. I know Carlos, for example, he's now on the board and he's one of the mentors um, helping those kids um, come into the program. And, you know, is you know, we have another Harlem kid coming in this upcoming class or in the 2020 class now, um, you know, that's going to be a part of our team. And, and, you know, I'm so excited to continue that relationship with those guys. One of the big things that's kind of happened in the last few weeks is one of your fellow face-off factory coaches has really, really separated himself from the professional pack in MLL and PLL. He currently plays in the PLL. But uh, Joe Nardella just won his second um, PLL championship in two years, as well as shattering any record for face-offs and shattering percentages, um, yeah. as well as putting points up on the board, which not a lot of face-off guys do in the PLL. Um, okay. Did you want to talk about that at all, or kind of what it was like to see him do that? Yeah, I mean, you know, funny little story, like, you know, we were talking before about, uh, you know, our face-off factory training camp in New England is, you know, this, even this past summer and last summer too, going into the, the pro seasons, um, I remember him coming down, and, you know, I'd been training with Max, who, you know, really dominant face-off guy as well, and going against Joe is always, you know, the big test to see, you know, where I stand and, and how I'm doing. And uh, I remember this past training camp was just, you know, 
he was smoking me. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I must be doing something wrong. Like he's not that much better than me, is he? And, you know, he's just dominating. And, you know, it ended up being that it wasn't just me. It was everyone that came. Um, and then, you know, finally to kind of see it all come to fruition at the tournament um, in PLL where he's just, you know, smoking people. And it's not even, you know, you know, people want to say he's a great counter artist or he's what, you know, really tenacious. Let's just say it. Joe's the best faceoff guy, right? Is statistically, you know, numbers wise right now is he's the best faceoff guy. And it was really crazy in how well he did, but he just was a freak athlete. He's just an unbelievable faceoff guy. So it was really cool to see that. It was awesome to be, you know, part of his training crew, which, you know, is awesome. Uh, I would love to take some credit for how well he did, but <laughs> I, I won't steal the, the spotlight from him at all. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, he, it was, it was really cool to see, um, all that hard work. I think, you know, the amount of hours that dude has put in, in training other people, training himself, um, playing, right. Is, you know, a full NLL season in, which, you know, you know, if anyone has ever played box and I haven't done an NLL, but, you know, playing in the NLL is tough. I mean, you get banged up and that dude went from a PLL season right into an NLL season right into another PLL tournament where he's just banging bodies left and right. And, you know, it's not easy to do. Um, and Joe did it and he dominated. Um, so, you know, super excited for him. Um, there's no one that deserves winning that and, and, you know, all the accolades that that dude's gotten more than Joe. So I'm really excited to see what he's doing because, you know, it's the show's not ending, right? He's, he's going to continue working and can hopefully continue to get it better. Um, and hopefully he brings me along for the ride with that as well. Yeah, absolutely. If those who don't know Joe, Joe is the hardest working guy. And like, if you saw any of his interviews, the first thing he did was deflect all the attention to the rest of his teammates. He, he's a huge team first guy. And I know he, um, he finished probably second in MVP kind of running, but he was, you just saw the look on his face when Zed won the MVP. He was so happy for him. And it was just awesome to really see him shine where he might not get as much attention as we think. Uh, obviously knowing him he deserves but it was really cool kind of seeing him especially on NBC because like that's that's like you said on ESPN that's a real deal like there are some people that just aren't lacrosse fans like oh I'm just gonna turn on NBC and they get to see uh someone we both trained with just absolutely dominate and then win another championship and the best part about Joe right is that regardless of how well he did if Joe went 25 percent um and you know no one talked about him he would have been just as happy because he is the biggest team first guy. He, he does not, he's the most humble guy when it comes to face-offs and, you know, talking about egos and, you know, wanting to win every single face-off, you know, you know, if you talk, if you look at, you know, clamp percentage or anything like that, right. Is Joe's first year in the PLL, his clamp percentage was like 35%, but the dude scrapped and got over 50% of his face-off wins, right. Is, you know, he just worked, he outworked everyone he played. And I think all that hard work kind of came to fruition and now where it's just, you know, he doesn't care what the numbers are. He cares if it's a win, it's in the win column or the loss column. Absolutely. And just kind of to talk a little bit, um, obviously you've coached at Mercyhurst and kind of now found a really solid home at Colby. What's mm-hmm. kind of been the biggest difference from the playing side of things to kind of transitioning to the coaching side of things? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I always joke around with the guys is, um, on the team and even to people still, is I'm still the young guy in on our coaching staff. So, um, I think one thing that I do well is relate to our guys and kind of can, you know, I've been in the situations that these guys have been in, whether it's through recruiting or, you know, you know, maybe a problem with the coach or things like that. So, um, you know, I think I'm kind of the perfect middleman um, and, and I really take on to that as my role. Um, but it's been really cool kind of stepping back and now being as a coach and kind of overlooking more than just a face off or just my specific role on a team. Um, you know, now I'm part of a team that's much bigger, right? Is I'm part of, I'm one of three on our coaching staff, but I'm one of 53 between the coaches and now the players. Um, so it's really cool to kind of step back and kind of see the whole field rather than just the middle of the field where I'm working on facing off. Um, and two, just really growing the game and understand my understanding of the game, right? Is, you know, I always tell people is, you know, getting into coaching, I was really worried um, because, you know, I'm a face-off guy. Uh, people think that I, like, go get ground balls and, like, bend my stick up a ton and then just run off and have no idea what lacrosse is after that. Um, but I also tell people, too, is that I probably watched the much, most film um, than any of the players when I was at Siena. And, you know, I didn't just cut it when I ran off the – or ran on the field, right, is 
I would watch the whole game and, you know, I loved learning about the offensive side and the defensive side and, you know, different, like small, really small skills that you could contribute. And, you know, I couldn't do it at the high level, but I could tell guys, you know, or show guys, this is how you do it. And this is how really good guys do it. Um, and I think that's kind of helped me evolve into the coach I am today of, you know, is realizing, you know, I'm not Lyle, so I can't tell you how to shoot one handed and wrap around the goal and do all these things. But I can show you guys that can and, you know, understand, you know, maybe you can't do that either. But, you know, this is a great opportunity to learn a new skill or add something to your repertoire. And then two is fit all those pieces into a cohesive offense or defense or team. Yeah, that's awesome to hear, obviously, that anyone who's played lacrosse has been coached and kind of figuring out what their role is in the game after they're done playing at the college level is always something that goes through every single person's mind. Yeah. Um, um, is there kind of closing, um, is there one or two like lacrosse memories that really stick out to you in your experience through starting to play when you said you were in like second or third grade to the bubble or to any coaching experience you've had? Yeah. Um, I mean, I would definitely say playing wise would be, um, two playing wise, I guess. So I, I guess I'll say two is one is my first college face off, um, against Johns Hopkins at Hopkins. Um, and it was the old rules when it was down set go and it was really quick. Um, and the ball was already down. And I think I jumped before the ref had said set, I was so nervous. Um, and it was on like ESPN. So it was like a big game. It was pretty important, you know, pretty important for the Seattle lacrosse team. And I jumped so quickly. Um, and I remember sprinting off the field. I was like, Oh my God, I just like, I, I got toasted on my first college face off. So that'll always be a lacrosse memory. I have um, a pretty funny one. Um, but then two of like my first pro game, um, actually playing, it was against Joe, um, Nardella when I was with the Rochester Rattlers and he was with the Cannons and, um, it, it just so happened to be on my birthday. So it was a pretty special day in that sense. My parents were all there. My friends were all there. Um, and I had a great game. We, we won the game and it was a game that we needed to make playoffs. Um, and it was just kind of like, finally that feeling, right. Is, you know, probably like when you get recruited and stuff like that of like, wow, like I actually made it, like I did it. Um, which was like a really cool, fulfilling, uh, you know, feeling that I had. And, you know, I'll never forget that. Um, but then coaching would probably just be, right, is like, you know, the first overtime win that we had um, here at Colby was against Trinity. And, you know, I don't think that we had beaten Trinity since I'd been here since, um, or before that, I should say, sorry. Um, but it was just really cool of seeing, you know, all your hard work of, you know, guys buying in and, and now I'm the guy that's blowing the whistle right of so guys buying into me um and like really trusting me and believing in me and then it finally coming to fruition and you know that point where you know there's no no more rules right overtime first guy to score wins and and our team to score wins and it's you know just everyone do whatever you can to to, to get that and guys you know you called time out guys listened and you know it's just a really cool fulfilling feeling as a coach so I'm I'm, I'm super excited that that was you know four years in my coaching career that's a great memory and I'm really excited to continue making more absolutely and uh, where can people find you to follow you on social media if you want to follow me um, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dowd Casey five um, and then all as well as um, FOF coach Dowd um, for where I do all my face-off factory stuff any um, drills and skills that'll all be on face-off factory coach Dowd as well Awesome. It's been awesome talking to you today and uh, look forward to the next time we can talk. Um, good luck with the rest of your coaching and pro career and hope to grab reps with you soon. Have a good one. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me.